All right. Thomas, I'm so excited hey. to be here with you today at Slush. Um, it's great to have you here in person. I believe yeah. it's your first time at Slush. Absolutely. And hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's a great place to be. <laughs> and Index has been privileged to partner with you since early 2021. And since a lot has happened, and there are a number of important decisions you made with regards to where to take the business and how to think about the product and the technology. And I'm excited to dive in a little bit more on these areas with you today. Before we go there, grocery is a very broad topic. And there are a number of different ways you could go about building a business in this space. So just to set the stage for, for the audience, what is Rolex and how yeah. have you thought about this? Right. I mean, I feel like um, over the last two, two and a half years, the industry has been kind of talked about left, right, and center. but. Uh, uh, I was introduced as industry veteran, so we <laughs> we started in 2014, and um, our belief uh, was that it has to be a um, grocery market for to, for online penetration. You need to be fast. You need to have an amazing assortment, and it has to be affordable. And those are three vectors that are really difficult to achieve at the same time. So we've been working on this since 2014, and you know, obviously with COVID, some craziness happened in the market, but I was always very adamant that uh, we will uh, prevail. So we're now in uh, six European markets offering uh, delivery uh, within two hours, so not 15 minutes, but we offer 15 minute delivery <laughs> slots, so very precise. We offer about 20,000 SKU for our customers, which is very large and differentiated assortment, and we are priced very competitively, uh, uh, so you don't feel burden to your wallet if you go to, uh, uh, to Rohlik as opposed to your supermarket. Um, and it's about um, 700 million in revenue, so it's becoming a sizable business. And, you know, one of the many areas that I admire you for is, as you said, you thought about this already in 2014. So in many ways, you took a contrarian approach early on. Um, what was it that you saw already then when you began thinking about how to elevate the grocery delivery experience for consumers? Yeah. So um, I was searching for a large market. So um, at that time, I was uh, already kind of um, being a founder of two other businesses that uh, we exited, uh, one to Secret Escapes, one to Delivery Hero. Uh, so if you're kind of becoming a third time founder, uh, you're looking for something very sizable because you know you don't want to kind of go through the same journey. Um, and the grocery was very intriguing because it was um, worldwide two trillion dollar market, and um, no one was doing it successfully, mm -hmm. right? And that, that 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 was very strange. The, mm -hmm. the penetration was really low uh, um, uh, of, of of customers shopping uh, shopping online. And that was the moment when I said, OK, I mean, there must be a way to crack this, mm -hmm. right? It's so big that even if it costs a lot of money, and in the end, we found a way that it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. We bootstrapped for right. you know, five years at least before uh, uh, expanding internationally. Uh, uh, but even if it did cost a bit of money, you know, there must be something in that market. And that was the reason why I've decided to start building. And then we were listening to customers very intensely because it was weird, right? So like people are going to those huge places. Yeah. Um, they spend a lot of time in there. Um, you know, the this, this stuff is not always fresh. And they do, they do it, you know, day in, day out. And when you talk to them, you know, why wouldn't you want to shop online? No one was able to articulate a good reason. So we were kind of digging really deep into customer insight. And then we realized, you know, it's not whatever's in the world, whatever was in the world at the time, was not better enough for people to break their habit. And grocery shopping is really deeply ingrained habit most people have you need to be better enough. And that's what we set out to do. And 
what I also find fascinating is that during COVID, when the world started talking, as you said, about instant 10-minute grocery delivery, you held firm in your belief that, in fact, um, the model that you had chosen um, what was perhaps uh, the better solution. And so how did you build conviction that Rolex is the right business and the right business model in the space? So obviously, we've been at this since 2014. So we had benefit of understanding the consumers and the business way before any sort of tailwind, any sort of virus coming to the, to the world. So the conviction that 15 minute delivery is not a necessity, uh, uh, we already had long before. And because we were bootstrapping, we couldn't afford it, right? We couldn't do 15 minute delivery anyway. That's one. Then it's physically impossible to do 15 minute delivery if you want to order large and differentiated assortment, right? So there, there is a time you need to assemble the order, yeah. and then obviously you have to deliver it. So we were looking for this sweet spot sometime in 2015, 16, and we actually intentionally slowed down, <laughs> right? We, we started with like an hour delivery, and then we realized no one really needs it in an hour. So uh, we kind of arrived at this 90 minutes slash two hour proposition, depending on the market. But that's, that's the sweet spot that we found a long time ago. And you're not just delivering a very convenient experience for the consumer. And, and perhaps as a consumer, that, that is what you see um, from a buyer perspective. Yeah. But actually, some folks might not realize the complexity that goes in behind all of that. And so I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about how do you build a product and how do you think about technology so that you build something that truly stands the test of time? And how have you gone about thinking about what happens in the back end on the product and technology side? Yeah. I mean, when I was thinking, what is the mode of the business, right? Well, what's going to be really differentiated? We very quickly realized it's not kind of buying an apple and selling an apple uh, you know, more expensively. Lots of people can do that. Uh, so we started building a tech mode, right? So uh, something that, you know, basically from the moment customer comes to the website to, to the order delivery and even what happens after the delivery, that's run by our proprietary tech. And we always understood that our position will be improving in time because we knew that the automated fulfillment centers are coming. And then we understand that autonomous delivery is coming. And those are the cost lines that we're happy to have at the moment, but obviously they are sharply de decreasing. And you know, it's making online grocery more profitable than brick and mortar retail. So, uh, but the mode is really the technology that allows you this real-time picking, real-time fulfillment of an order, delivery within minutes, right? Uh, but not 15 minutes, <laughs> 60. <laughs> um, um, with being profitable, right? And we are profitable in a couple of markets, and uh, we're heading very strong to profitability in Germany as well. Um, so um, I think just being technology-based, even though obviously on the outside it often looks like a couple of guys in cars and you know someone is buying uh, some stuff and yeah. selling it with some margin, but but the core of the business is is really hardcore tech. Another thing I really admire about you is your customer obsession. Every time we talk, you're mentioning the latest NPS numbers, the latest engagement numbers that that you're proud of. Can you elaborate a little bit more on this? How do you think about delivering a product that customers love? So this is my third consumer facing business. So I really worked intentionally on the skill of acquiring a knowledge around customer insight. Um, and I see a lot of entrepreneurs not paying enough attention to that customer insight and not hitting that product market fit quickly enough. And you know, I spend a ton of time with consumers still now 
when we expand to a new market, mm. I very intentionally talk to our target audience, but I also like when we were opening Vienna, I walked in one day 25 kilometers and I, was, I would visit all high-end and all mid-tier mid stores and I would be looking, you know, like what are the gaps in the meat selection, yeah. right? What are the gaps in fruits and vegetables, right? How's the freshness? And I would be looking for that sweet spot of what we should be right. offering. So it is like this machine of acquiring of customer, uh, customer insight uh, constantly, whenever you go on the, on the website, there is a question that pops up. We're constantly learning. The yeah. assortment that we've built was 100% consumer curated because we were asking, what are you missing? And then when someone was missing something, we would just put it in the assortment. Very inefficient in a way, but very, very consumer centric and that built the penetration. And, and just to double click on launching in a new market and I'm sure many fa founders in the room are also thinking about expanding, how do you decide on where to go next? It's it's combination of data, right? So we look at the um, factors in ECT, number of households, average spend per on groceries. We go really deep into the data. Um, what has been showing that in every big city in Europe, there is a market for us, right? But it's like, how do you decide between Munich and Berlin? Yeah. Between Berlin and Frankfurt, right? For us, it's better when there's like the, the, this, this portion of affluent customers is as big as possible because we're not going in with the price only proposition, right? So we intentionally deprioritized Berlin, which is larger city, but in an, in an essence poorer city, right? So there's less of that affluent consumer base that we're targeting. And when I say affluent, it's 40% of the population of the city. It's not 5%. So, so that's that. And then what I talked about, and then we go on the ground to the market, speak to people, visit stores, and combination, we call it art and science. Every decision we have at Rohlik is art and science anyway. Right? Science is the data, art is some sort of gut feel and insight that you collect uh, uh, over time. And as you think about this journey starting in Prague, expanding to Hungary, Austria, and now you're in, in Germany also, was there a particular inflection point in the business, would you say? Couple. I was, uh, so for, we were really on the ropes in 2017, right? Like, you know, j just to give you a sense of like the bootstrapping that I call. So we, we spent in this market, grocery, which kind of has this notion of being super expensive. So we spent 7 million euros to build a business that was 150 million revenue in size, right? Wow. So it's not bootstrapping per se, like the, you know, hundreds of thousands, but single digit millions to get to that size. But in 2017, cash was running out. Um, no COVID, so investors did not care about the market so much. They came later <laughs> and I had to pretty much like borrow money and then against that money I would have to pledge my house. Wow. Um, so you... And, and basically we had this seven month shot to get profitable and we did. So I did not lose my house. Yeah. So that was, that was one. That, 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 was a, that was a big one. Um, and then obviously as we started expanding I had to let go a lot, right? So I was running the market. I was really deep in execution. Um, um, and now I'm running sort of a group uh, with several markets, with standalone CEOs, standalone operations. So it's very different kind of leadership. It's not this hardcore, you know, I know every career by name type of execution. Um, so I had to learn a lot and also mature as a leader. So that was an inflection point. And, um, working uh, um, uh, with a uh, couple people, you know, um, as mentors uh, definitely yeah. helped me. So, you know, I'm mentored by Ajay Kavan, who's uh, 
uh, who's ex-VP of Amazon, and this really helped me to understand how to scale the business. And so on that note of people and hiring, can you share a little bit about your hiring philosophy and, and what do you look for in those individuals that you want to take the business to the next level with? So hiring has been a huge learning curve for us because um, obviously in Czechia the market is really small so we, we knew people we were hiring that sort of thing. But as we expanded, and the expansion happened really fast, so we were one country business in 2019, and we were five countries business in 2021. And obviously that meant, meant hiring hundreds, thousands of people uh, in different geographies, and we were not equipped to do that. Yeah. Right? So it was just crumbling, and like one thing that really dawned on me, uh, is that the sooner you codify the culture, yeah. as in really write it down, and be very intentional about hiring for that culture, uh, then you're just going to make series of trials and errors. right? So, Because no matter how good your hiring is, if you're not hiring for your specific execution culture, even great people will fail. Right? Because you can you know, have a great conversation with someone whose CV is amazing, yeah. right? But one of our, um, we call it raw leak ingredients, yeah. is moving fast. And that is not just that, uh, but it's, it goes very deep into leadership behaviors. Right? And then if, for example, someone in their career has not been used to build MVPs, minimum viable products, they're going to be completely lost in our company for a period of time, right? So if you hire someone to a senior position and they are lost, they're not used to being lost, that's one. So you have disengagement instantly, right? So uh, um, it's then hard to fix. So codifying culture, writing it down, and having interview questions specifically for that, for those ingredients, we have 10, uh, has helped tremendously with engagement, um, um, you know, employee retention and also employee happiness, right? Because we have the right team now yeah. as opposed to a team. Yeah. And just taking a step back, Rolik is not your first business. In fact, you've had two prior businesses, both of which you have exited successfully. What, what motivated you to start Rolik and to really keep going? I'm a builder. Like, I, I thought about investing at one point, <laughs> right? So I would have those coffee chats with people, uh, amazing entrepreneurs, right? Uh, and I would be thinking, I wish I could do that. Yeah. Like, really be in their shoes again and build that stuff, yeah. right? Giving them money and then observing, just like, like, it's not me. I need to be there on the ground and really execute. That's and, who I am. And were there any key insights that you took from your two prior businesses that you felt, I, this is something I'm not going to do again? Yeah. No, I was really shitty leader. <laughs> uh, so um, if I was learning anything, uh, and I probably still, still am, but uh, it's getting better. So <laughs> it's this leadership journey hmm. that I kind of embarked on uh, um, that was the massive learning, right? Because you always kind of retrospectively realize your leadership mistakes. Um, so this is for companies. So hopefully, at some point, I'll do a really good job as a leader. Uh, and you know, when I say I'm really hard on myself, so like that's the ultimate, ultimate bar. Uh, and um, you know, I think it was just improving on on the customer acquisition, inside beliefs. How do we build the tech? Uh, how do we structure the team? It was more iteration from the previous businesses than yeah. like a clear no no. Do you have someone you inspire or a business that you truly inspire and that influences your decision making? Um, a few, but none fully. 
right? I, I, I like I, I try to take a lot of good things from a lot of the companies and a lot of the leaders. Um, I never had this like ultimate inspiration, um, except maybe at one point Elon Musk, but uh, I'm a bit conflicted at the moment. <laughs> um, but you know, it's there's a lot of companies that do something great. Um, like if you look at who was able to scale in commerce, the obvious one would be Amazon, right? Yeah. But that's like part uh, of Amazon that I would be inspired by. Yeah. And the way, for example, like they run tech and, and um, um, some of the other things are not so inspired. Um, um, uh, so, so I think this, I, I just take up different things from different people and different products. And, and when you take all those different ingredients that, that inspire you and you apply them to, to Rolex and just thinking ahead, where, where do you want to take Rolex in the next two, five, ten years? So I think we've built something that is truly scalable, right? Because we have a technology that powers fulfillment center that is automated, uh, that very quickly fulfills orders that we can deliver very quickly, right? So it's just a number of those fulfillment centers we're going to have in Europe and the world. So first step is being a pan-European player. Yeah. Um, and we're on a good journey. Uh, we, we, we're going to make uh, uh, Munich and Frankfurt and then Hamburg, uh, where we already have uh, fully automated fulfillment center profitable. Uh, once we have that, then we kind of built a few more German cities and then expand to other geographies. There is obviously not to be a tone deaf. There is a uncertainty in the market. So we have a fairly long runway. Um, and it's time to be observant of your runway uh, uh, because you know uh, things can happen in the next few months on the consumer side that uh, bring change. Uh, so all I said is with this in mind. Yeah. So it's not a reckless expansion. Yeah. It's very sustainable, very mindful of runway expansion. But uh, we phrased in. Um, July, I think. Yeah. So we're very well equipped for that. And I'm really happy that this craziness of uh, COVID and yeah. our, in our market especially is over because businesses that are fundamentally right, like ours, uh, were not overlooked, of course, but they were not uh, certainly valued as high as uh, players that are now really struggling. So. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think it's back to the core, and right. that's what back I'm happy fundamentals about. Fundamentals and getting the yeah. right core in place. Yeah. We're coming up on time. Are there any final words of advice you'd like to give to some of the founders in this room? Find your purpose. Um, you know, my, my purpose, and like I, I do this sort of third business in a row, is to improve life of consumers. Um, in retail, so um, whether there's a crisis, whether there's COVID, um, you know, or there's a heyday of funding, it does not matter because you're kind of fulfilling your purpose. Yeah. So I know that whatever happens in the world in the next two years, I'm still going to be doing what I'm doing, um, and and we're going to be doing it well. Um, if you jump on the latest Fed. Right, okay, everyone's setting up blockchain startups, you know, I want mine as well, or everyone founding quick yeah. grocery, uh, then you might be disappointed a few years down the line because it's not really a purposeful thing to do. Thomas, thank you so much for being here today. Round of applause, everyone, for Thomas. Thank you. And, uh, and thanks to Index for supporting us for so long. <laughs>